I apologise, I don't care. 16 minutes to 11, time to open the line. 0772, that of course is for Preston, and then 561000. We're here until 2 o'clock, and if you don't dial carefully, I have a magic button here these days, and I press it, and it electrocutes you. So 0772 561000. Red Rose Radio. Good. It wasn't too bad. It, I mean, it went on a bit. It was like the old scat singers. Do you remember scat singers? I mean, probably before your time, really. But it was people that used to sort of go, they didn't sing any words or anything. They just go, yip up, yip up, yip up, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't awfully interesting. But it was a sort of music hall entertainment before my time also. But I've seen it on the good old days, you see. 11 minutes to 11. Time to take our first call. This one's from Alan. How do Hello, Alan. I see. Seems that it's beyond Alan to answer. Are you going to or not? No, you're not. Never mind. We can get by without you. Hello, Graham. Are you going to speak, Graham? Hello? Oh, well done. I'm here. Uh, yes, I know you're there. I was wondering whether you were going to speak or not. What do you want? I want I'd like to express the actual behalf, on behalf of... Um... Graham, you're in no position to speak on anybody's behalf. I suggest you speak on your own or keep your trap firmly shut. So have you got anything to say? Yes, right, um, I'd like to express my behalf on the actual attendance of all the police in the Juventus, when the Juventus football crowds were, all the trouble was happening. Uh, excuse me, Graham. Yes? Is this the first time you've listened to the programme? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Then I think it's only fair that I should tell you, the same as I tell everybody else that attempts to mention football, that we talk about nothing to do with football on this programme until the Test Match series of cricket is over. Because cricket is interesting, whereas football is absolutely boring. David, how are you? Hello. Hello. I'm calling from the Parallel Universe. The Parallel Universe. And I've just got a message that the world will end on 28th of August, 1985. Well, that's all right. I get paid before then. This is due. The fact that we are it's not June, it's August. Oh, funny. Yes, I know it was funny. To the fact that we are clearing the highway, the intergalactic highway. I see. For space travel from this I see. into ours. Is this a reverse charge call? No. Oh, that's all right. Well, I wouldn't want people to be charging us for ringing all the way from the alternative whatever you said. Very good. I knew that would get shut here. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Mr. Bezik. How are you? Very well. I'd just like to say that in Liverpool, there are very few facilities. And this afternoon... When you say very few facilities, would you like to specify the facilities that you would like to be there that are not, given that Liverpool is an enormous city and appears from where I'm sitting to have everything that anybody could want? Well, apart from the garden festival, um, the swimming baths near to where I... Live. Oh, you want one in your street? So when you say <laughs> Liverpool has no facilities, you don't mean Liverpool hasn't, you mean, you know, the house next door to you hasn't? No, I mean... I see, because um, Liverpool is a large place. Oh, yes, I mean, And there are one or two swimming baths in Liverpool. Yeah. I've swam in probably about four different swimming baths in Liverpool, including the ones at the Walton Roundabout, Picton Road baths. Yeah. I mean, how many bloody swimming pools do you want anymore? You wouldn't be able to move about without flippers. So we've established that there are quite a lot of swimming yeah. pools. Is there anything else you want? An ice rink? You've got an ice rink in your street? No, no, no. Well, there's one of those in Liverpool. Yeah, Football no. club? Got quite a few of those. Not very good, but you've got them nonetheless. No. Um, museums and art galleries. Yes, you've got a loads of those. Old buildings, despite the fact that your council seems to enjoy pulling the damn things down, you've still got a few left. Shops. You can't move in Liverpool for shops. County courts, magistrates courts, police stations, usually called bridewells in Liverpool for reasons I don't understand. Lots of roads, houses, multi-storey flats, some that no one wants to live in, some that everybody wants to live in. Uh, hospitals, I used to work in one of those. Is there anything I've mentioned so far that you think doesn't exist there? Um, no. So those are actually quite a lot of facilities. Well, yeah. And they're in Liverpool, so what are you talking about? Well, I'd just like to say that, um, that the staff at one of the swimming baths Oh, I see. So when you say there are not quite a lot of, there aren't enough facilities, what you mean is the facil facilities that are there, that earlier you were saying are not there, you don't like the staff in the facilities well, that actually you believe aren't there anyway. The staff were rather ignorant. Well, of course they're ignorant. They have to do with cretins like you. Good night. I'll do to Johnny. Hello, Johnny. Johnny Rumble. Johnny, you'll have to talk a little less quieter and just, just, just a soup songs further away from the microphone, otherwise you sound like a, a bolt of thunder or lightning or something. Now, what were you saying? 
This is Johnny Rambo speaking. Hello, I'm Johnny Rambo. It's very nice to talk to you. When you think about cars... Yes, it's Fiesta Week on now, and John Wilding's Garstang come along and see the finest selection of new and nearly new Fiestas in Lancashire with prices starting from only 1,150 and low mileage bargains with just 1,000 miles on the clock. As ever, John Wilding will offer you the best part exchange price anywhere and an unbeatable deal on finance. So if you're even thinking of a Fiesta, it's well worth a trip to John Wilding's Garstang, especially during Fiesta Week. When you think about cars... How do you to Phil? Hello, Owen. Um, I'd like to talk about the royal family. What would you like to say about them? I think they're unnecessary, because um, other countries can do without them, so why can't we? Which countries do you have in mind, Phil? France. France. USA. You would like a system like they've got in France and USA, where they replace their royal family with a president? Yeah. Who has exclusive and total power, such you as the just, idiot, the idiot that's dragging America the into war? Are just money wasters, in my opinion. Money wasters, mm. and presidents aren't. Presidents well, are an economic bargain, are they? Well, I suppose. Um, well, don't uh, suppose. You've got a firm opinion. You said they were rubbish. Okay, don't then. suppose. Be rather more specific okay, than suppose. Um, the best group are Marillion. Yes, I'm sure the best group are Marillion. I'm sure they're absolutely wonderful for hey. cretins like you. Good night and hello to Paul. Um, I'd just like to say, Alan, that the Who are the best band there's ever been. Drop dead. I'll do to whoever's next. John. Hello, Alan. Hello. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about dogs fouling the put footpath. I'm sure you would, but I, honestly, I've not had my tea very long ago and I don't want to talk about it. Damien, what do you want? Hello, Alan. I'd like to talk about driving tests, please. What would you like to say about them? Well... Have you passed oh, yours? Well, they driving tests, do da, do da. Oh, they failed it, driving tests, do da, do da, do Lad, you lousy swines. The poor lad is probably going to go out now and anyway. he's going to go out and tup himself. And if ever I see you on a crossing in a steamroller, I feel sure that I'll run over your throat. Hello, Mark. Hello, I want to talk about heavy metal. I'm it's sure you do, but why talk about it, lift it, take it with you and get out of my life? Hello, Andy. Hello. Hello. I'd like to talk about him. Um, whether you think the king-size Mars bar is good good value for money? No, I think all Mars bars, king-size or otherwise, are value for money. People could be wasting their money on things like motor transport or nuclear weapons or proper food, whereas well, Mars bars are, are absolutely wonderful. Well, don't you think it's a bit unfair that they haven't got a king-size marathon? No, I think it's unnecessary to have a king-size marathon. Nobody in their right mind would eat that dross. Yeah, okay, I'll see you then. Well, that's very kind of you. You may not see me, of course, but if you think you will, you will. Hello, Anna. Hello, Alan. Hello. I would like to talk about um, Manchester Airport and how disgusting it is. Well, I'm not stopping you. Would you well, like to go see, ahead and do so? I've got, I want to, I'm going to Portugal for three weeks. Have you been to the airport yet? Yes, I've been to Manchester Airport many a time. Many a time. Are you going to, uh, to Manchester Airport when you go to Portugal? No, that is the problem, you see. Why is it a problem? Because if you don't like it, if you think it is disgusting, why do you want to go to it? Why does it cause you a problem when you can't? Because, you see, if we want to go to Portugal, we have got to pay 580 odd pounds for three people to travel from Heathrow Airport. Because Man Will you tell me what this has got to do with Manchester Airport? Because Manchester Airport have not run, not run, don't run a service now. Because the uh, to get to Portugal, right to Lisbon. Right. Airport. So your your statement that Manchester Airport is disgusting is based entirely on the fact that they have withdrawn their service to Portugal. That is it. Would I be right in saying, do you think, that Manchester Airport would have liked that service and all other services out of that airport to remain? No, but... Well, let me tell you, you are wrong. I would be right. Indeed, the airport would be absolutely over the moon, which is a good phrase for an airport, really, isn't it, in the circumstances, but they would be very pleased to provide services anywhere. The fact is that the airlines or airline, if to a singular, that was providing that service has chosen not to do so anymore. That is not the decision of Manchester Airport, but the decision of the airline. So would you like to withdraw your inaccurate remark? No. I see. So you are basically just prejudiced against Manchester Airport? No, because... I see. No. Can I explain? You can try, but yes, I doubt that well, you have the wherewithal see, so to do. We do. Manchester 
airport do now flights to Portugal. But no, can we just establish, first of all, Anna, that the airport is the bit that stays still? The flights are done by the planes, which are owned by the airlines. The airport itself doesn't go anywhere. It's rather too heavy for that. Yes. So okay. Manchester Airport doesn't do flights anywhere. It merely provides a strip of tarmac for those that wish to do flights to various places to land on and take off from. Yes. But now, we, you see, when we go on holiday, we go for four weeks. Normally. Well, this is really interesting, yes. Yes, well, I'm sure it is. But now, the only... They won't do, like, if you want to return flight, they now won't do, or the planes won't do, won't do flights. They'll only do flights to Portugal, a return flight to Portugal every two weeks. But that is the decision of the airline. I ask you once again, Anna, in the hope that you have the wisdom to be accurate this time, do you think that you ought to withdraw your mark and level it rather more accurately at the airline rather than the airport? Yes. Excellent. So there we are. So we have established that Manchester Airport is not disgusting after all. Red Rose Radio. The 11 o'clock news, this is Alan King. In South Africa, three Asians have been stabbed to death tonight in a township near Durban and their bodies set alight. They're the latest victims of interracial violence in the area that's left at least 70 dead and houses burned and looted. But Winnie Mandela, the wife of jailed black leader Nelson Mandela, is blaming the arson attack on her home on government agents and not looters. From Johannesburg, Nigel Wrench reports. Years, the little house was ransacked by police last week. Mrs. Mandela was in no doubt who is responsible for destroying it altogether. It is the South African government, through the police, through the uh, security branch. Mrs. Mandela was banished to Brantford by the government. She says authorities must now build her another house if they hope to keep her there. Nigel Wrench, IRN, Johannesburg. Air crash investigators say they found a vital clue which could explain the jumbo jet disaster in Japan. A piece of tail section from a Japan Airlines plane has been found in the sea off Tokyo, more than 100 miles from the scene of the crash. And as Kevin Murphy reports, it was found along the flight path of the doomed airliner at a point where the pilot said he was losing control. What's been found in the sea is the huge vertical stabilizer from the tail section of a Japan Airlines jumbo jet. Experts say it's highly likely to have come from the doomed plane. And in Britain, 747 pilot Ian Fro from the British Airline Pilots Association says that without that stabilizer, the aircraft would have been extremely difficult to control. If it fell off cleanly, they would have quite severe difficulty in controlling the airplane. It provides the stability of the airplane lengthways. Only four of the 524 people on board the jumbo jet survived the crash. Remarkably, those survivors only had minor injuries. But among the dead is British businessman, 28-year-old Kim Matthews from Enfield in Middlesex. He'd been to see his family in Britain to introduce them to his Japanese fiancée. The NUR Rail Union looks set for a showdown with British Rail this evening after the BR board threatened to sack 270 striking guardsmen. A national rail strike has moved right... <laughs> How do to Jim in a mole? Red Rose Radio. Good evening. Ah, Jim. Hi. You all right? I'd like to talk about the state of this country at the moment. What would you like to say about the state of this country at the moment? Well, I left school two years ago and I haven't had a job since and it's making my penis go dead somewhat. <laughs> Perhaps you don't need it. Perhaps you're too weak and unmanly to ever get the opportunity to use it, James. So don't worry about it. Cut it off. You're not using it for anything. You can sit down for a wee. And hello, Alan. Hello. I'd like your advice, please, on uh, a business I'm considering setting up uh, concerning hiring out software to people. And, uh, when you say software, do you mean this computer Computer software, that's oh, correct, oh, yes. yes. Um, the trouble is that, co that all the software that uh, houses, software houses, bring out is copywritten and so for me to uh, bring out this business I'm going to have to uh, ask the people about this copyright to overwrite it and see if I can get to uh, hire out the software without um, over, without incriminating myself can you uh, yes. give me any advice of how to get around that how I can uh, get uh, authorization it's very simple. Find out who owns the copyright, write to the owner of the copyright, and ask if you can be a, a lessor of that 
copyright, or a lessee of that copyright, and he'll say, yes, give me 60 grillion zillion pounds, and you can. <laughs> Simple. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Tara. Ron, how are you doing? Good evening, Alan. Good evening. I think you're a tard. You Pardon? I can hardly hear you. What did you say? I think you're a tard. A tard? Yes, you ought to be dealt with. Yes, what's a tard? Oh, I forget it. Okay, I will. Hello, David. Hello, uh, last night somebody came on talking about uh, computers and why they were, like, knocking jobs out. Yeah? Well, somebody came on saying why they were, and another person came on and said why they weren't. Would you like to give us, first well, of all, where uh, you stand on that, and then substantiate it? Y you were arguing why computers were installed. Um, the main word what didn't come up was speed. Speed. A computer is a damn sight faster than what a human being is. Yes, the issue wasn't about whether it can do the job better or not. The issue was whether it did somebody's job or not. Now, the gentleman, I think it was a woman actually, that said that computers replace people was challenged by a person who said that if you get a computer, the employment quotient, if you like, the total people employed by your company increases, and I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Now, where do you stand on the issue that was at debate yesterday? Oh, I agree with that. Computers do uh, knock out jobs, as far right. as I'm concerned. As far as you're concerned. Does that yeah, mean that well, you've had your job taken away by a computer? Uh, no, not really. That is just your opinion, that's what you meant. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Uh, pardon? Excellent. Yes, we agree. Well, I wouldn't say that we agree, but we've established what you've got to say. Well, say a big company, for instance, they install computers for speed, they will suck a certain number of people for a speed. For instance, it's, it's, a lot long, it's a lot shorter time to tap a few numbers up and get a file upon a video than a person going up to a filing cabinet, going through a load of files, taking out the right piece of paper, etc, etc. But most companies have to have a double safe system anyway, so surely the manual system remains, does it not, as a backup to the computer? Do, do people trust computers that much? Yeah, I'd say so. They do? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll join Mick quite soon. We're butchering meat right To Mick. You all right? Hang on. There we are. Hello. Hello? Hello. Hello, it's Mick from Kirby here. Yes, hello, Mick from Kirby. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is, uh, you know, like, hygiene laws and that. I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, like in chip shops, like... Hello? Yes, you're wondering, like, in chip shops, like... Well, the thing is, for some, like, sort of novelty thing in a chip shop around by ours, you've got a parrot in there. And uh, I'd, I'd like to know, you know, what hygiene laws say about this. That's the parrot. No, but the thing is, last week the chicken fried rice. Yes. I was really shocked about it, you know? Yes. Okay? Yeah. So what's, you know, could you tell me more about this, like, the, the chicken, chicken fried, fried rice? rice. And the pa what did the parrot do whilst the chicken the parrot, was fried? I don't know, it started screaming that uh, the fish was getting battered, like. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, well I, I wouldn't say it was okay, exactly. I mean, Tom O'Connor isn't at risk from you, is he, really? His job is safe, isn't it? Goodbye, Mr. Bezzard. And Goodbye, Mr. Mick from Kirby. Hello to, I've forgotten who, Bob. Hello, Hello. Bob. Hello. Yes, hello. Are you on your deathbed? You sound like you are. No, no. I, I, all I'd like to say is that I think Adolf Hitler was a moderate. A moderate? David, we'll be with you quite soon. Oh, hello. I've come about the nude models. The what? Well, I heard your... How do you, David? Hello, Alan. Hello. Hey, Pete. I was just wondering, man, how come a prat like you's got a job? What do you do? Work. I asked you what you did. Not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah, because Well, I don't do a lot either. Do you yeah, earn much money doing things. not a lot? I argue with people all the time. Do you, uh, do you earn not a lot, or do you earn quite a lot? I work, actually. But Sorry? I was just wondering how come a person like you actually got a job. I mean, how many CSEs have you got? I haven't got any CSEs. How many O-levels you got? I haven't got any O-levels. Well, how did you get a job? Why do you need O-levels to talk to idiots? I don't know, Alan. That's why I'm talking to you. I see. I asked you why you need them, not do you need them. Oh, why you need them for yes. educational purposes? You see, if you listen carefully, you will find that the question is there to be answered. I realise it is always difficult for some half-wit cretin such as yourself to do so, <laughs> but do pay attention. Go away and realise what you've just said. I sit here, earning a lot of money, talking to people like you, who are jealous because you work hard for buttons. That makes you stupid, me sensible. Count your CSEs, fellow. Malcolm, what do you want? Oh. 
Did you see Brookside today? Yeah. Well, no, Ed McInnes was supposed to go to the shop. Yeah. And she was on AIDS, like, well, I don't reckon she did. Because, you know, that fella mugged her. I reckon she went to the doctors, no beer, she's going a bit nutty like. And I reckon mm. she's got VD. I see. Thank you very much. Out to Paul. Hello, Alan. Hello. I was watching a program, like, the other night, and it was saying that sunbathing can cause skin cancer. Yes. And they were saying, when the interviewer asked the fella why it caused skin cancer, uh, why the rate was going higher, he said he didn't know. Well, I reckon it's sunbeds. I reckon sunbeds are the cause of skin cancer going higher. And, and that's it? Well, I reckon they should. Well, first of all, can we just correct something? Because you, you did actually make a crass error there. Because yeah. the gentleman being interviewed didn't reply, I do not know. He said, I think it has probably got something to do with the increased frequency, frequency of Mediterranean holidays. Now, that may well mean, I don't know. I'm not awfully clear. Yeah, well, but I think it means more people are going abroad, don't you? Yeah, well, so I when you said yeah. that he said, I don't know, you now can see that basically you were just telling a pack of lies in order to make your attack on some beds sound more sensible. Well, so basically you lie to get your point across. Are you going to answer any of these questions? Pardon? Granted. Good night. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Alan. Alan, a couple of years ago, I was a patient in a, a hospital after taking an overdose of Valium tablets and Nemtol capsules. Now, the overdose was not intentional simply, well, an act of greediness. Now that's the Greediness? Say, you like Valium, do you? Uh, well, I do, Alan, yes. You do? Now that's you enjoy Valium? Uh, yeah, I do. That in itself is evidence of rank insanity, surely? <laughs> no, not really. Not really? But so, Alan, having a partions for taking Valium yeah. is evidence of what? Well, I, I, I've got... I've is evidence of what? It's a simple question for a simple man. It's an evidence of... Oh, my God. No, it's difficult I to take Valium, right? Did they ever let you out? Have they let you out recently? To get a buzz off them. Uh, to get a buzz? Why don't you go to the buzz stop like everybody else? <laughs> but How long have you been out of this hospital? Uh, I've been out now for about uh, three or four years. I think it's time you went back. You're still an idiot. Hello, Gary. Hello? Hello. Is that you on? No, he's gone home. Hello, Sarah. Hello. I might like to ask you if you were the fellow in the grey suit on Brookside. No. The grey jumper thing? Um, grey jumper thing. Well, I was I was wearing a, a blue and white striped, but very pinstriped, uh, casual jacket that may well have looked ice blue or grey, and has short red hair. I'd also like to ask you, what, what time are you jumping off the pier? I'm not altogether certain, but there are 32 of us, and we do it not simultaneously, the pier isn't quite that long, and we do it one after the other. I think I'm somewhere in the middle, and we start about 12 and finish around 2.30, weather permitting, of course. Um, could I have a signed photograph of it? You'll have to write in and send me an envelope, and yes, you can. And, uh, by the way, you told me mate to drop dead before. Has she? No, she hasn't. Then tell us to do so immediately. I don't like my orders not being carried out. Wally, hello. Wally. Hello, I'm Boyzer. You're Boyzer? I'm Boyzer. Then why do I think you're Wally? Is it that you are a Wally? No, I'm I a see. Boyzer. You're a what? A Boyzer. A Boyzer. Very good. Well, I prefer girls as myself. Hello, Amazon man. What is your proper name? Mark. What do you want, Mark? The That's first, th the first the thing you need, Mark, is a little more years. Hello to whoever it is. Dave. Hello. Hello. Alan? Yes? I'd like to know why you're so very fat. Because I eat a lot of Mars bars. Why are you so stupid? Good night. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Goodbye, Steve. Leyland Garage. Leyland Garage for four. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Hello. Hello. Hello, Alan. Hello. I'd like to talk about sex underage. And what we'd like to say about sex underage. I can't get enough of it. I'm sure you can't, but you would if you weren't so spotty and cretinous. Hello, Pete. Hello, Alan. Uh, could you solve a problem for me, please? I have no idea. Uh, I work for a company, I'm not saying a company's name, mate. And I was, uh, one of our vans broke down. And we took the van to a garage. And the garage we took it to. 
went to us one of her vehicles, one of her vans, and uh, while this van was on loan to us, I got pulled up in it by the police, and uh, they checked it over, and they found out that it had two ball tyres and other things wrong with it, like, and uh, they said because the vehicle was on loan to our company, like, at the time, as whoever was driving it would be responsible for it. Is that the end of the tale? Yeah. Um, I presume you have a question you wish to ask? Well, I was on you know, that's the question, would I be liable for yes. being prosecuted or anything for that? Yes. Even though the, the company took responsibility because I was driving the van. And you were driving it with bald tyres. Yeah. It's an offence to drive a vehicle with bald tyres. It's not a great difficult job for you to go and have a look at them before you drive it away, is it? Not really. So that's what you've got to do, isn't it, next time? Okay, then. In the meantime, well. pay your fine. Hello, Richard. Hello, I'm phoning in about... You're too young, whatever you're phoning in for. Mark, what do you want? Uh, it's a bit of a problem I've got, actually. Um, it's, uh, flatulence. Both flatulence. Basically. basically, you are a windy person. Yeah. Never mind. Put a bag on your head. Do Put a bag on your head. Preferably polythene and take deep breaths. It really does cure it. Hello, Nicky. Man, you cures most things as well. Hello, Nicky. Hello. You're too young. It's no good. Mick, what do you want? Hello, Nicky. Mick, what do you want? Hello. Hello. Well, you're going to turn your radio off. I shall come back to you forthwith. But go and turn your radio off in the meantime. I refuse to talk to myself. Hello to whoever's on line six. That's Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Uh, hello. No, you're Stephen. Yeah. I'm Alan. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about the effect on pig-headed unions. Pig-headed unions. On the effect of the man in the street. Now, today I travelled up to Edinburgh on the train, and in Scotland, they're on, the guards are on strike at Glasgow. So, we're coming home, and they cancelled three trains in a row back to Preston. Yes. And uh, the train we were travelling... Why are these men on strike, do you know? Yeah, because of this one-man operated business. Basically, the employer is wanting to introduce something that they do not want the employer to introduce. Yeah. Uh, and because they do not kowtow to their employers, lick their boots and say, thank you, master, you think they're pig-headed. Have, yeah, consi have you considered that it may well be British Rail that is pig-headed by trying to introduce a system that has not been fully negotiated with the representatives of the workers at, in their employ? They're trying to help their customers. Never mind that. Yes, they are trying to help their customers, and wouldn't it be a good idea if they used the due process of negotiation in the meantime, and therefore would still be able to honour their obligations to their customers? Because let me tell you, the National Union of Railway Men has no responsibility to you. British Rail are the people that have the obligation of travelling, or, or providing you with travel. They're the people you give your filthy lucre to. You don't give it to the trade unions at all. Oh. So the fact that the trade unions true choose not to drive the trains because they think the attitude of BR at the moment stinks isn't a problem for you. The problem for you is that BR are unable to satisfy the desires of their employers sufficiently to honour their obligations to you. So if anyone is being pig-headed and affecting the customer, it's the person that has the obligation to the customer. They're the people that are failing in that obligation. But they're not. That's they're not. Right. So you did get a train. Oh, yeah. I well, what do you mean? About. Well, just a moment. What you said, first of all, was that the trade unions were being pig headed and causing you a problem tra yeah. in transport. Tell you what happened, then. I'm not interested in what happened. I'm well, sure it's that. Relevant, I'm, it's relevant. It's not relevant. It may well be relevant. relevant However, sorry. what I'm trying to say to you is thus, Stephen, that the obligation of providing you with transport lies exclusively with the person to whom you pay the money. For transport and that organization is British Rail yeah. so if anybody has failed you it is British Rail well, they're, they're trying to provide a better service no than the British road. Rail today failed you they didn't it was like so you got the train did you yeah, yeah, did you get walking about. so you didn't have any problems today oh yeah yeah so we... somebody caused you problems today yeah now who did you give the money to for this transport I, I gave the money to the booking clerk. Yes. Who does he work for? He works for British Rail. When yeah. you gave it to him, you weren't giving it him to, to go and get a lunch, were you? You were giving it him for 
as a representative of British Rail. Yeah. So you were actually, indirectly, I would suggest directly, but for the purposes of this conversation and for your low intellect, indirectly paying it to British Rail. Yeah. So you entered into a contract with British Rail. Yeah. You are now telling me that you were not satisfied with the, if you like, the honouring of that contract. British Rail honour. Uh, you are now telling me that you are not satisfied with the way British Rail went about honouring that contract. I am satisfied with it. You are satisfied. Yes, why you want to meet... Well, excuse me a moment, Stephen. Why did you start this conversation and why have you insisted throughout this conversation that you were dissatisfied with the service provided today? Because a lot of people... No, why did you tell me you were dissatisfied with the service? I don't care about a lot of people. MPs represent others. You speak for yourself if you're big enough. I, I was, I speak was for yourself, Stephen. You I... were dissatisfied. So, yeah. so, you entered into a contract with an organisation who failed to satisfy your desires. Yeah, and, I want yeah, and you agree with that, do you? You agree with that, do you? We know what you wanted to do. We all know what trains do. It doesn't come as a surprise to any of us. Now, what we're trying to debate is whose fault is it? Now, you maintain, because you're bigoted against unions, that it was the union's fault. No, I but I maintain, Stephen, that your contract was not with the trade union, but with British Rail. So if anybody failed you, it was the people that had a responsibility to you. They were trying their best to get... Of course the they were trying their best to honour that obligation, but they could have tried a little harder by not trying to rip off their staff. Yeah, but it was the union's fault. This no, it wasn't. Listen, well, you may find this hard to believe. It, it's a very, very difficult thing, but when there is an argument, there are two sides to it. Oh, yeah. Now, if you end up a victim of that argument, the responsibility that makes you a victim, or the cause that makes you a victim, is the argument. I accept that. Now, the argument is between two people. Why have you chosen to blame one group of people, when in fact the argument is between two groups of people? Yeah, but British Rail... Why have you chosen one group of people, when the argument is actually it's between two? Fault. It's How can it be their fault? The trade unions did not, in a vacuum, say, hey, we're not doing the trains today. Somebody started the process, and that somebody was British Rail. And what they did was they said to those men, you are in future going to operate one-man trains. And then she said, no, we're not. Yeah but, they, they can... yeah, but what? If your employer came to you, what do you do for a living? I'm a, I'm a dairyman. I You're a dairyman? Yeah. What does that mean? Oh, I, I bottle up milk. And, you bottle uh, up milk. How many bottles a day do you do? About a thousand. About a thousand. So if your employer came to you and said, from now on, we're going to do it blindfolded, standing on one leg, you'd say fine. Well, that, that, no, that is being silly, Alan. No, it's not being silly, actually, because what you were saying is that the National Union of Railway Men have to do whatever British Rail tell them because British Rail are trying to provide a service. Yeah. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Let us give you a more, a more likely example. If your company says to you, look, you're supposed to deliver 1,000 bottles of milk and we've got no bottles, so I'm sorry, you're going to have to take it round in buckets to all the houses, what would you say? Well, well, how do you think those poor bloody people would feel? We're getting no milk and that bloody swine of a union won't bring it. Yeah. So it'd be the union's fault. It'd be your fault entirely. Well, that's going down it'd be... the scale. No, it's not going down the scale. It's hitting you where it hurts and dealing with you in the same way that you're attempting to deal with the National Union of Railwaymen. Might I suggest to you that you use your brain instead of your mouth, preferably in that consecutive order. Brain, then mouth. Good night. Hello to whoever. Oh, we promised to go back to Mick. I wonder if he's got his radio off. Hello, Mick. Hello. Well done. What do you want? Uh, I'd like to sing just a dead short song, Alan. Very clean as well about the doll. Is that all right? Well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Go on, get on with it. All right. I've lost my gyro, what will I do? I've lost my gyro, what will I do? I've lost my gyro, what will I do? Go to the dole and kill them. My God, they're not all locked up yet. Hello, Brian. Hello. Hello. Yes, we've done that. What do you want? Oh. Um, Nelson Mandela. You want Nelson Mandela? You can't have him. South like Africa's him. got him. I'd like him free. Well, I wasn't going to sell him to you. <laughs> Why would you like him free, Brian? Because it was, it's not really a crime, is it? If it was in Britain, it wouldn't be a crime. In South Africa, whatever he did was a crime. He actually was responsible, or was a member of an organisation, I think it was called the Hang on, the ANC, if I remember, African National Congress, I think it is. 
and he was actually a member of that, a very senior and guiding light member of that, and was one of the people that advocated armed insurrection. I think any government that had a person in their midst, midst or midst if you prefer, who was actually advocating armed insurrection would lock them up. Or well, fighting for freedom. I think any government that had a person in their midst advocating armed insurrection would lock them up. What's insurrection? You look it up and come back to me. You want to talk about the problems of South Africa? You don't even know the language of this country. Jim, what do you want? Oh, I'd like to say I've never realised how stupid Lancashire people are. I'm sure you haven't. That's because they're not. Good night. Hello, Kelly. Hello, Kelly. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How old are you? How old? Mm. Seventeen. I see. I'd like to talk about uh, the prices of food nowadays. So I think it's very high. It rather depends on what you buy, doesn't it? Well, I mean, everything. I mean, it's very dear nowadays, don't you think? As I say, it depends what you buy. If you buy aubergines and pineapples, it's rather expensive. If you buy bread and margarine, it's not that expensive. Well, I think it is, because... Uh, In that case, we have a difference of opinion that is insoluble. Eat less. How do to Carol? Hello, Alan. Yes? Hello, I'd like to take time to speak, if I could, about methods of contraception available to men at present. At the moment, there's only one reversible method, the sheath. And if I could explain, I'd like to propose another additional or alternative method that men could use. Mm -hmm. This sounds interesting. Go on. <laughs> How about <laughs> keeping the zip shut? Go on. <laughs> this is uh, just basically that sexually active men could make deposits, if that's the correct word, in a sperm bank and then go and have a vasectomy. Mm -hmm. And this would mean that they could have responsible and active sex life without the fear of impregnating any poor woman. And when they did want to have children, they would then just go and make a withdrawal from the sperm bank. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, this seems health-wise a better solution or alternative to the methods available just now, anaesthetically speaking, because the sheath, I don't know about you, but I don't find the sheath are turned on. No, well, I, guess. I, don't find any, I, don't, I don't find anything you put on Willie's a turn on, to be honest. But, Carol, it strikes me that it's, on the face of it, a very sensible idea. But imagine the situation. Some guy does exactly what you advocate, right? And makes his deposit. I've always wondered about the interest in that, but that's another story. But he makes his deposit, or deposits in the plural. And then he finds the woman he wants to spend the rest of his life with, or they find each other to be less sexist, and they decide to get wed and all the rest of it, or indeed to set up home and have children. Uh -huh. And he says, well, um, we're going to have to go down to, to Liverpool or Manchester or wherever B-Pass is and um, get you one of these ice cubes. And she's not going to be overpleased. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's well, no, you don't. That's that's the whole point, isn't it? You don't. Well, know. it's something it'll take a bit of getting used to. I don't see that it's any more sort of revolutionary than this at present when you expect women to take a hormonal tablet, the effects of which we're not very sure of for mm -hmm. the most of their fertile life. Mm -hmm. I think most women would rather, uh, you know, the sort of clinical and artificial insemination, you know, once every few years when they want to have children, rather than have to spend their whole lives on some other method that may harm them, and I know a lot of women who have been harmed. Well, if nothing else, Carol, I'm prepared to say categorically, your heart is very certainly in the right place. <laughs> I'm not sure that society is ready for this yet. It, mm. it actually smacks of... <laughs> you know these, these space films, you see, these future yeah, films I where we have a supreme race? I mean, it smacks of that, and that, that worries me, because it, it wouldn't bother me, to be perfectly frank, it would not bother me. Uh-huh. But, but I think do you it not might think that that's a cop out then in, in the male the species, not you in particular, but speaking in such a way that society isn't ready for it. But yes, it is a cop out. But, uh, but the they are ready to put the risk, put at risk most of the female population. Of the yes, they are. But what we have to establish first of all is, Carol, I do not think, and I know you use the term majority. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't use that term so very lightly, and I do not think that a lot of women would be prepared take that step with their man. They might be. You don't uh, well, yes, they, try it. Indeed, they might be. I'll accept. But your original statement was that the majority would. Now, I find that hard to swallow, and I'd be interested to hear... It's hell hard to swallow. Yes, it is hard to swallow, but unfortunately, and I do accept that it is 
an inevitable consequence of a male-dominated society. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, if men had to have babies, that I promise you it would have been resolved years ago. Yeah. But they don't, and society is controlled by men, and the biggest problem for people like me and hopefully like you, who try not to be sexist, it's easy for a woman not to be sexist, it's very difficult for a man, because I've, seriously, I've had 36 years of being pressured by society into being sexist, the same as every other man on this yeah. western part of the globe anyway. So it's very difficult, I have to concentrate not to be sexist, it's very simple for a woman because she is the victim, and it's easy for the victim not to like the treatment of the aggressor, yeah? Okay then. But Thank it's very difficult for me to say that women would accept it. And more important than that, I find myself as an individual correcting as many women for sexist statements as I do men. Oh yeah, I, can, I know that. Now what that indicates to me, Carol, sad though it may be, no, not may, is, sad though it is, is that most women, or certainly a lot of women, actually believe their species, or their half of the species, to be subordinate. Oh, I don't think you can go far to see that. Well, why do they make sexy statements? I have had people on this phone-in, women on this phone-in, arguing vehemently, and I mean vehemently, that their job is to sit at home, have babies, and look after their husband. Oh. Now that is crap. I know that's crap, but... But I, mean... I have had women in the dozens arguing that on this programme. Oh, I heard women say that as well. But, uh, now, as long as that mentality exists, yeah. I don't think it's a simplistic step or a short step to get them to accept the policy you advocate. It's a, a start. It's trying to change people's attitudes. All in favour in trying to change, Carol. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Good on you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Paul, how do? All right, Alan. Uh, just a quick word over this dog fighting business. Uh, do you not think they could make it harder for people to get, like, the breeder terriers or, you know, same as if you were going to get a shotgun licence or something, where they vetted you, like? I think vetted is perhaps an unfortunate term in the circumstances, but what do you mean, make it harder? Well, like, same as anybody can get a dog, can't they? Yes. And it's going on behind all these people's backs. Uh, it, can, it can happen anywhere now. Could they not make it harder so that... Uh, Yes, I, I heard what you said. I didn't ask you to repeat it. I asked you to rather explain it more, or more specifically, specify some way of making it harder to get terriers and the like. Yeah, well, uh, all I'm saying is, like, if, if they could, uh, same as, you know, it, go through if you've got, got, like, a criminal record, or if you've had a, any uh, dealings with RSPCA cruelty to animals... The great that, problem with that is, of course, that... Dogs are not registered nationally, they're not registered legally, or there is not a legal register of them as there is with guns. We know how many guns are made in the country, we know how many guns are legally brought into the country, therefore we know how many guns there are. And when a person wishes to purchase a gun, he has to buy one of those that we know to be in existence. Therefore it is a fairly simple process, by comparison, to check whether a person has obtained a gun illegally or not. Now, if we had to register terriers, we would first of all have to register their births. We would, before even that, we would have to find out how many they are at the moment. And when you say terriers, do you mean crossbreeds involving terrier? Because if you do, that involves every Heinz 57 mongrel in the country. It does seem like an awesome task, if indeed a worthwhile task. Why not just kick seven colours out of them when we catch them? Well, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just a quick word before you go. Well, Thanks. we don't... Make sure the tide's in when you jump off the pier. Yes, I will. I was, I was told today, to my absolute horror, that the water will be 20 foot deep. Oh, well, you'll be all right then. Make sure you come back up after 20 seconds. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I, I'm trying not to land in the water. It, it is a flight contest, and I, I mentioned on the news this morning that I may have to take a breather in the Isle of Man. OK. Well, if you don't surface, I'll put in for your job, all right, Alan? <laughs> I hope you get it. OK. okay bye -bye. There's a lot of people want this job, and none of them would like it when they get it. Claire, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I'm all right. Good. Listen, I've got a bit of a problem. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Well, um, I went to the doctor's today, and he said that um, I'm semi-schizophrenic. Right. I'm you just said it like that? You're schizophrenic? Yeah, I'm semi-schizophrenic. Semi-schizophrenic? Yeah, I don't understand it. It's a bit stupid. But I, I, I think that's what it means, actually. <laughs> a bit stupid. Pardon? 
I don't know what it means. You don't know what, what it, mean. it means. Well, it's very difficult to tell you what half a word means, or indeed what a word means divided by two. Why don't you ask the doctor? Well, the doctor won't tell me. He won't tell you? No, I asked him and he said, oh, well, I can't tell you, love, sorry. I see. Well, go to the library and obtain for yourself a medical reference book and look up schizophrenic and you should be halfway there, shouldn't you? And yeah, given that okay. he says you only have to be halfway there, that's cracked it. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Get your other person to ring tomorrow. When you think about cars... Yes, it's... Fe ...to the, a split personality. So if you've only got one side of a personality, you're half schizophrenic. Half means semi. So everybody that isn't a split personality is a semi-schizophrenic. Maybe you just meant you were ordinary, Claire. Hello to... Brendan. Hello, Alan. Yes. Uh, oh, I'd just like to ask your advice on how are employers bound for a contract of employment to their employees? That's a non-question. When you say how are they bound... Sorry, are they uh, legally bound to provide a contract of employment to their employees? Well, I'll answer your question with a simple answer and then I'll tell you the specific answer. First of all, when anyone is engaged in employment, they have a contract of employment, full stop. If I say to you, do you want a job, you say yeah, I say 20 quid a week, you say okay, you start, that is your contract of employment. You will work, I will give you 20 quid a week. Yeah. Now, the law has complicated it slightly by saying that there are certain specific terms that have to exist. Is this this two-year business whereby... Well, there, no, let me, let me finish rather than asking questions. And one of the rules that they've introduced is that an employer has to provide his employee with a written statement of the basic terms of his contract of employment within 26 weeks of the commencement of that employment. In other words, from start and work. Right. So it's within half a year, six months. He has to provide you with a written statement as to the basic terms of your contract of employment. Yeah. If he fails to do so, or indeed if she fails to do so, you can take them, whether they be male or female, to the county court. Sorry, to the industrial tribunals, my apologies. You can go to the industrial tribunals and they can issue an order saying what your contract would be. But given that if you've worked there seven months, they can sack you merely because they don't like the colour of your hair almost, it would be an unwise course of action to take. So therefore, if, for example, you've been working for a company for one year, 11 months, 25 days, and uh, you still do not have a contact of employment... I'd keep your trap shut for the next 11 days. So you have to wait... But if... Um, well, you see, you used a word there that unfortunately is unacceptable. You said you have to wait. The answer is no, you do not have to wait. No. You don't have to. Well, but you would be far better for waiting... The your job. For the safety of your job. You'd be far better than waiting until you've been there two years. If, uh, for example, uh, I understand, unfortunately, from personal experience, that if you are have your employment terminated uh, by your employment...